I'm Eugene Fitzgerald. I'm a professor here at MIT. I'm the Merton C. Fleming's SMA Professor of Materials Engineering. And I arrived here in 1994 after having seven years of experience at AT&T Bell Labs, uh, where I worked on new semiconductor materials and devices. We were fortunate to discover high mobility strain silicon there, which today is in Intel microprocessors. And at MIT, we continue to work on new kinds of um, uh, semiconductor materials and combining, especially combining semiconductor materials together on a silicon platform. And we've been able to now produce um, high efficiency solar cells on silicon. And that's created a, a new venture for us um, using that technology um, in, um, in applications that uh, need high efficiency solar at, at a lower cost. And um, my students uh, work in a variety of areas today from working on more traditional semiconductor problems all the way to um, semiconductor use in, in energy besides solar cells. We have projects in thermoelectrics and also in thermo photovoltaic devices. My uh, interest in innovation began at uh, AT&T we were fortunate enough uh, to uh, be able to be involved with a very important innovation around strain silicon, uh, which, which enhances the electron mobility in, um, in circuits today. So your microprocessor has that, that in it. And um, uh, one of the frustrations, though, was what was happening a lot in the large corporate labs at that time was that they would find the beginning of an innovation and um, it was really great progress at the beginning. They were to find a very important uh, new discovery and new beginning of a new fundamental innovation, but usually those companies could not commercialize them. Um, in AT&T, we did the same with strain silicon. AT&T Microelectronics still produced uh, many different products but I could see after a two or three year effort that it was going to be very difficult for a researcher to build up whatever was needed internally to actually make a real commercialization of that technology. And it was that, it was that frustration that led me to get interested in why is it so hard for people to have such a great research result and not easily be able to impact the product or the marketplace. One of the most important things to be able to commercialize uh, technology later in a, in a better way is to start off with the right idea at the beginning. And this is something that um, unfortunately a lot of people aren't thinking about today. And that process is what we discuss in our, in our book Inside uh, Real Innovation, where uh, it's actually folding in things like what are the applications that, you know, are, are sort of dependent on solving this problem and then how do people deal with this now and how do they make things now and all those things kind of fold into picking the right research problem up front and that automatically increases your chance first of all of, of commercializing it later and, and that's why a place like AT&T Bell Labs for example had such a good track record for producing those early innovations, even though they, they, the end process uh, they were not efficient at. But the reason that so many uh, ideas and innovations came out of Bell Labs in the early stage was that they had all those elements because on the market side and application side, they, had, they made everything from transistors to telecom systems, so a very rich uh, customer base, if you will, that's right inside the company and you could meet those people at the cafeteria table. Right, the famous Bell Labs, you know, lunchtime table. You'd have these people that work in all these different uh, areas, and then here you are responsible with thinking about well, what's the right thing to work on? Uh, most people have categorized Bell Labs as sort of just being an industrial academic place, and it wasn't because it was expected that you would kind of pick problems that had a high chance of impacting something in AT and T in the future. We are purposely being very vocal about our concerns about innovation in the United States. We believe that actually even things like the financial crisis that we're seeing everything else is, some, is related fundamentally to lower growth uh, because the innovation pipeline has changed in the country. And uh, at, a, at a very high level, it, it, 
fundamental innovations that produce growth for decades, high growth for decades, are connected to developments that take 10 or 15 years uh, to move even after research into the commercial marketplace. And um, so these things can be uh, changing in the background and most people are probably not observing you know, what's happening. So one of the challenges today is that ideas that were pre-invested by basic corporate research labs, uh, people that have carried ideas around that are hatching over those 10 or 15 years have received beginning in the 80s uh, uh, great access to capital and many of those ideas have been commercialized and created the great companies that we know today. I think what has been a little less obvious is that um, the, uh, the new seeds or pre-seeds that we should have for the future have not been, uh, been created. To a large extent that's mostly because um, corporate America has not been able to invest into long-term research labs like they used to because they're in a global competitive environment. If you look today, a corporation might have what they call R&D, but if you compare that to R&D 30, 40 years ago, it's really like D and almost you know pre-production, really. But when Moore's Law slows down a little bit, the lack of growth and, and unemployment and things like that are, are a consequence of just not having that kind of innovation growth that we used to have.